Hi, colleagues. Thank you for joining. Um, as people are trickling in, um, it'd be great to also get a sense of who's in the room. If people would like to type maybe your name and where you're joining from in the chat, just so we can get a feel for that. Um, so it's eight o'clock. And since we have a really full agenda, I know more people will be trickling in, but we'll go ahead and just get started now. So thank you everyone so much for joining this webinar on bringing indigenous and local wisdom to knowledge co-creation for nature, which is featuring the trialogue approach and the work of the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Network. Um, so this event is co-hosted by three different UNDP communities of practice, the human development, integration, and environment communities, since it's of course a highly cross-cutting issue. Um, and I'm Sophia, I work with the UNDP's SDG integration team. I'm not the moderator for today, but I'll just be briefly welcoming us into this session by setting the stage of why it is we've chosen to have this learning series specifically on harnessing the tools of dialogue to help us work in ways that are about building new conditions, capabilities, and really social relationships for transforming systems. So overall, this series is inspired by a resource that our SEG integration team together with the Human Development Report Office and a group of UNDP senior leaders who took part in our Certificate on Systems Transformation co-design called the Field Guide for Human Development Report Dialogues, which essentially takes some of the methods and principles of awareness-based modes of systems transformation and offers entry points for applying these to how we essentially hold space for sense-making and decision-making for development. And this idea of awareness-based models to understanding and working on systems ultimately comes from this recognition that I think more of us in UNDP and development in general are increasingly reckoning with that you know, tackling the root causes of complex, interconnected, highly uncertain development challenges requires much more than just technical solutions and know-how. Deep systems change really starts from fostering capacities that help us see and situate ourselves in the systems we're working on, operate from a place of connection between our minds, hearts, and hands, and really between each other. And to find kind of practical entry points to navigate these seemingly abstract dimensions of change, as UNDP, we've been working with the MIT Presencing Institute since 2020, inspired by their Theory U framework, among other approaches, to help practitioners learn ways to bring the idea of interchange and relational change much more into the fore of how we have processes to understand and respond to our material or external challenges and problems. Um, and we've done this through a range of global dialogues, an action learning lab, a leadership certificate. And we've also benefited from um, connecting these learning journeys um, and application of new approaches to the human development report, because both the previous report and the one that's coming soon really home in on issues that call us to think about the how of development instead of simply the what. So the types of human security, insecurity it talks about, it compels us to really think about things like how we change mindsets, cultures, and norms, and what this means for the ways we co-create policies for uncertain futures, um, which the next report will also really get into more looking at polarization and solidarity. And this is why our field guide really tries to give more significance to the work that is involved in building relational infrastructure for more just and inclusive policy processes. And it suggests essentially that giving more attention and intention to the ways we design and hold space for change through dialogue um, can unlock new forms of resilience and innovation. So with that bit of broad framing, we're so grateful to have the colleagues we have today to learn from in this work of reimagining what dialogue is and can do, not necessarily focusing on specific tools that are in our guide, but more broadly wanting to showcase different teams and projects that have already been in many ways embodying principles of awareness-based systems change. Um, and we know that even though there's tools and guidance out there, it can be hard to know how to apply them without this inspiration from concrete examples. And this couldn't be more important and relevant than in the context of bringing indigenous wisdom to knowledge co-creation, which I think as many of us know can be an intention sometimes fraught with these histories of mainstream institutions and processes being a bit more exclusionary in the norms and ways of working rather than really achieving inclusivity and participation that honor many ways of knowing and being. So I'll be handing it over now to the Besnet team who are the moderators for today and we'll introduce the rest of the panelists as well. So I'll give it to Yuko Korachi, who's the Besnet coordinator and program specialist. Over to you, Yuko. 
Thank you very much, Sophia. And then I would like to once again uh, welcome and thank you um, everyone uh, here for joining today's uh, webinar. Um, and uh, I'm Yuko Crouch once again, and I'm the program specialist at the UNDP Nature Hub, and then also the coordinator of um, this Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Network Initiative, or BestNet in short, which was just uh, introduced. Uh, and then to explain today's uh, program, as shown in this slide, uh, I first make a short presentation to introduce the BestNet initiative and then provide an overview of the Trilog approach. And then um, I'll hand over to uh, Pippa Hellings, who has kindly been uh, supporting us for years um, as a global Trilog facilitator to modulate the um, panel dialogue session and the subsequent uh, interactive session. Um, so this uh, dialogue session will be uh, joined by the four speakers. Uh, which include uh, Ms. Pernilla Marmar and uh, Ms. Uh, Ashnapuri Hertz from Sweet Bio, Dr. Lilian Chimpepo uh, from the Environmental Affairs Department in Malawi, and uh, Mr. Felipe Ribella Asanin from the Alexandra von Humboldt Biological um, Resources Research Institute uh, in Colombia. Uh, and then these panelists will share practical insights and experiences on the dialogue approach and their applications. And then this uh, lead to our closing remark by um, the uh, Terence Hay Eddy at UNDP. And then they back to Sophia, uh, who explained the way forward on the future learning series. So now um, I'll go ahead and explain more about BestNet and Trilogs. Uh, BestNet is a partnership-driven initiative led by UNDP, uh, UNEP uh, World Conservation Monitoring Center, and UNESCO. Uh, and then it is supported by the government of Germany and Sweet Bio. And it has started in 2016, and since then, the project has been committed to complementing the work of IPES, uh, which is the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And uh, our aim is to leverage their tools and in a series of assessment findings to foster the culture of um, evidence-informed concerted decision and actions among policymakers, scientists, and then practitioners. Um, and then to that, and our work cuts across different levels. Um, at the global level, we partner up with not only IPES, but uh, more than four, 140 um, like-minded organizations and initiatives to regularly exchange and then disseminate the latest biodiversity and ecosystem services related news and then resources through um, various online channels. And um, at the national level, um, drawing from the IPES, uh, guide on assessment production, uh, we support the countries in filling the country level best evidence gap, and then help the co-creation of comprehensive national ecosystem assessment or NEAS. Uh, and then for that, we bring together experts and stakeholders from different disciplines and knowledge systems. And then we also provide selected country with the seed fund called the Best Solution Fund to catalyze the uptake of the key IPES assessment and then any findings and the messages into uh, policy research or on the ground project arenas. And then finally, uh, but not least, uh, we uh, created the trialogue approach as a tool for enhancing uh, policy science practice um, tripartite dialogues and interactions throughout the uh, National Ecosystem Assessment Knowledge Co-Creation, and then the Best Solution Fund Knowledge Co-Application Processes. And then in the middle, as shown uh, in this slide, Indigenous and Local Knowledge, or IOK holders, are considered the key to this triangular interaction process, as well as across the other um, the BestNet components. Um, in broad terms, the two well-established methodologies inspired the development of this uh, trilogue approach, among others, uh, particularly guiding the participation of IOK holders in this complex dialogue space with policymakers and in scientific um, the communities. The first is the multiple evidence-based approach, or MEV, uh, which actually highlights the importance of recognizing um, different types of um, knowledge or worldviews, expertise or experiences up as complementary and then equally varied, um, such as scientific knowledge, technical, indigenous, traditional, local knowledge systems, all of them are equally important issues. And the second is, as Sophia said, health uh, theory U, uh, which offers the techniques and steps to gather people who may carry different and diverse backgrounds, such as social positions, cultural beliefs, power or interest, 
uh, and then those people from different perspectives into a common space for mutually listen, contribute, recognize, resonate, and then proceed to co-create new ideas together in the end. Um, drawing from these methodologies, Trilog is often adopted as a, um, as a tool in a situation where challenges or its flip side um, opportunities are identified to bring multiple um, stakeholders together for constructive exchanges and then joint decision making. And then we call this challenge and opportunity moment as icebergs, as um, illustrated in this current slide. Um, and why we call it icebergs? Because the visible part of those issues, challenges, opportunities that we look at, such as different positions between the government and communities on local resource use, or different sectors of people talking, not talking to each other. Um, those issues always contain deeply rooted invisible context that we have to also take into account. Therefore, um, the key stakeholders around those issues or themes are engaged from the very early planning stage or we call pre-trialogue stage. Uh, and then they will help to co-create the trialog program rather than inviting those people simply as event attendees. Uh, and then as key informants, they provide insights into like both visible and an invisible, invisible part of the icebergs. And then those will help us to co-create the agenda and then let us know with what kind of issues, what, what is the magnitude of the issue that has to be addressed during the trilogue. And then possibly that discussion will lead us to identify different associated icebergs, which may be also con contributing to the main iceberg that uh, is going to be addressed as theme. Um, and then when like we are talking about the trilogues and then engaging the, the stakeholders, we also look at the different levels of the or spectrum of participation. And in this slide shows, yes, this is like varying the, the level of the participation, which could be aimed at the different field of the stakeholder engagement. And then each level has its unique purpose and then distinctive value. So we cannot say which is better, which is like less uh, useful. However, uh, given the nature of the trialogue uh, dedicated to promoting tripartite interaction and agenda or action co-creation, the trialogue approach is considered more suitable for the stakeholder engagement levels of involvement, collaboration, or empowerment. And then once the level of engagement is identified based on the iceberg data we see, um, the trialogue, each trialogue will set the the realistic and then clear purpose, uh, which is understood by all, uh, such as what uh, participants should expect from the trialogue and then what kind of pledge as organizer of the trialogue deliver to the participants. Those like mutual understanding is very important so that the people will be like moving like more clearly towards um, that purpose together. Um, and then given the contextual specificity of the icebergs that the trialogue the address, no single trialogue event or a process is organized in the same fixed way. Um, rather, well, based on the past experiences, we created the menu of um, tools and then approaches to be used flexibly to facilitate productive interactions and then cross fertilization of knowledge at, among the participants. And then just to share uh, with this um, the slide, some of the examples. Um, so the for to, to give the, um, the well, the free and then open space for dialogue, the uh, background resources relevant to the trialogue themes are compiled and then circulated in advance as background documents. And then a list of participants is also shared um, to all the participants to encourage prior interactions where possible. And then this like a prior advanced arrangement will help lower the walls among the participants and also level the playing field for people to participate uh, within the dialogue space. Um, another example that like we, we often um, apply is the infield dialogue or we call workshop, um, which is arranged as much as possible at earlier stage of the earlier part of the trial program to create a space where um, participants, particularly from the indigenous and local communities can naturally lead the sessions and then contribute their expertise and insights more comfortably and then freely. While other, you know, the participants such as from policy sectors or science sectors would be more mindful of listening and then inquiring. Also, where applicable, uh, we 
organize the agenda in a manner to let uh, participants use their senses free um, to deepen their understanding of the theme, not only by talking, hearing, and watching, but also by tasting, smelling, or even touching. And then for, for that purpose, um, for example, when the trialogue was organized around the IPES assessment on pollinators, uh, pollinator dependent crops and ingredients were incorporated into luncheon and coffee break menu. And then also community or private sector participants were encouraged to organize their own stand to present the pollinator dependent products that they are selling or they are producing. Uh, then uh, through those um, the arrangement, people can also taste uh, what kind of the products are really like pollinator dependent and what kind of the, the products they are like purchasing or using on a daily basis. And then furthermore, uh, typically uh, more towards the um, at towards the end part of the trialogue sessions, the high level uh, meeting is um, encouraged to arrange um, as an opportunity to have the common voices around the, the trialogue teams to uh, which are reached by the three communities um, directly heard by um, policy and decision makers. Um, such an arrangement also encourages the participants from different communities to come together and create the uh, concrete joint agendas and then plan for actions. Um, so these are some of the examples that the, we apply. And then we are uh, regularly reviewing and then developing further the menu of tools that the, we could apply uh, for different uh, trilogue settings. Uh, given the time constraints, I will stop here and then hand over to people for more practical discussion on the trilogue application. But I'm happy to also share more information and then make clarification uh, in case of um, the comments or questions in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yuko. Thank you very much for that introduction. And we're going to now go into a panel session where we will hear more about the theory and then the application of all of these approaches that Yuko has talked about. But before that, because what we talk about is interaction, is understanding, synthesizing, mobilizing all the knowledge and knowledge and worldviews in the room, we'd like to start first of all with a little interactive exercise. We will use Mentimeter and Alex will help me now to put up on the screen the um, address, which will be www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And with using the code which is there on the screen, you can also, with your phones, use the QR code, which is at the bottom left of your screen, which will take you straight into this online interactive um, space, which will also then have the slides for the following sections of our webinar. So if you can use your mobile phones or open a new tab on your laptop or computer, go to www.menti.com. And when it asks you for the code, it is 81583715, which is the number on the screen at the moment and should also be in the chat at the moment. And we're talking about describing the way you work because just as Sophie and you have said at the moment, this goes beyond the technical side of this. This is about principles, values, approach, the opportunities, but also the challenges that we have in a way to effectively work together and incorporate um, indigenous knowledge and local wisdom. We've already got some really strong words coming up there within our word cloud. Um, and what I'd like you to do is for everybody to come into that word cloud, I will now start to introduce the panel. You can still keep inputting into the menti.com while our panel speakers begin their um, introductory words too. And we'll have another moment later on during the webinar to come back to some of these words, because obviously all of you in this webinar have a huge amount of knowledge too. And so thank you, Alex. If we now come on to the 
presentation and introduction to our wonderful panel today of um, partners and collaborators. And as Yuko said at the beginning of the meeting, from Swede Bio, a partner with our UNDP BESNET and UNEP WCMC and UNESCO partnership, we have um, Puri Hertz, who's going to speak first of all, who's program officer, followed by Penilla Malma. We will also have Dr. Lilian Chimpepo from the Environmental Affairs Department of the Government of Malawi, who is the IPBES National Focal Point, followed by Felipe Rivera Sanin from the Humboldt um, Research Institute in Colombia, all of whom who have worked with this approach, with the trilogues, with the national ecosystem assessment and applying this multiple evidence-based approach. So without much further ado, I'm going to ask one of each of them from Swede Bio, from the Malawi government and from the Humboldt Institute in Colombia to give us an introductory three to four minutes around a couple of questions. We will then go into a deeper dive as we look into the application of these approaches in specific examples where our panelists will have around seven to eight minutes to give you a bit of that deep dive. And we will hold tight to making sure we have a dialogue session of 30 minutes interactive Q&A with you, the participants, following that. So you'll get instructions during the chat to put in the chat any questions that you have for our panel. And first of all, I'd like to start opening up and thinking about the theoretical framework to this. So Puri, Ashina Puri Hertz, Programme Officer for Swede Bio, just give us an understanding of what is the MEB, M-E-B, the Multiple Evidence-Based Approach, and why it's particularly relevant to the trialogue framework for knowledge, co-creation and action. Thank you very much, Puri. Thank you very much, Pippa. Um, yes, thank, thanks everyone. Um, I think Yuko actually gave a very nice overview also in her presentation beforehand that the multi-evidence base or MEP approach was developed to guide inclusive process for uh, collaboration across knowledge systems based on equity and usefulness uh, for all actor um, involved. So it emphasizes that indigenous, local and scientific knowledge systems are complementary and that all are equally valid and useful for informing sustainable governance of biodiversity diversity and ecosystems. The relevance for the trialogue so, um, is in particular how it facilitates and support equal learning and sharing across knowledge systems, emphasizing again on the usefulness of for everyone involved. So we actually started to explore the MEP approach together with the Sweat Bio partner organizations among ILK holders, so indigenous local uh, sorry, indigenous and local knowledge holders or ILK holders over a decade ago, inspired by a dialogue in the indigenous territories in Gunayala in 2012. So it was just before um, the meeting that established the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services or IPBES, which is the institution that is assessing the latest evidence of the status of the world biodiversity in Panama City. Um, so leading scientists from UNESCO and elsewhere participated together with ILK holders. The ILK holders described also how frustrating it was um, uh, for them when scientists insisted um, in proving the evidence for their ILK with scientific method before they could believe in them. And sometimes even investigating things on their line uh, on their land without free and prior and informed consent and not even asking them about their knowledge. And so it was a great process for the ILK holders when IPBES, um, in the week after where IPBES was established, agreed to recognize nice and respect um, ILK in its foundations. From that, we started a process to explore how this best should be done and by working together with piloting partners, then the MEP approach was born. So as you can see the picture next to me or kind of behind me, um, illustrate a model for a process with MEP approach. So in the middle, you can see, um, yeah, you can see, um, 
uh, the knowledge streams and above also the enriched pictures of what is coming up when the um, when the streams of knowledge are coming together like um, and on equal level. So you can see there kind of the um, colored strands um, that represents actually the contributions from different knowledge systems. So it's indigenous or local knowledge from different territories and communities, scientific knowledge from uh, different disciplines or traditions or practitioners knowledge. I just have a question. So if basically you can see the picture properly, so unfortunately, what it's a little bit it's reversed, so it's back to oh, front. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I think if you continue, and then what we'll do is while we have the other people presenting, you can sort out that technical issue. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. That 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 would be really good. So um, and then like so you can see the institutions that include science and um ILK institutions. You see the actors there. Uh, which are ILK holders and scientists, but can also be policy makers. And then they collaborate in a process where all are equally valid and listened and respect one another. So it is really important to start this process actually with a joint problem formulations, what to investigate from the very beginning. And this is how to engage in a knowledge co-creations. And then you can see also like with the cycle there that we basically um these are actually the phases of the process itself we start with mobilization which means that holders of knowledge are getting confidence to explain and argue of their knowledge and then after that it comes the translations which is also a very critical phase and often missed many times when um actors or different actors meet and it's often that you don't understand one another and could cause a lot of trouble and also this exemplified in a negotiation process, for example. And translations requires engagement with free prior and informed consent so that all actors are fully aware and have consented to the conditions for sharing and spread the shared knowledge. And the third one is on the negotiations, or here's the joint analysis of convergence, divergence, and contradictions. Um, this is the discussion where you make a joint analysis, where um, knowledge is converging or uh, diverging and creating a safe space. And the last one is actually the synthesis. So you can see like all the different dots are coming together, but um, not all, and it's okay, because this is also an opportunity where we see that we need a uh, co-creation of a new knowledge. So this is how the map is working and it's well applicable and underpinned to support the trialogue uh, process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Puri. And I think what we can do is either have a slide that we bring in or somehow work out how to reverse um, the back part of that. And so, okay. now, thank yep, you thank you very much. And what would be lovely now is to move across to um, Lillian um and i don't know what we've got on the screen just now but if we can move across to to lillian dr lillian chimpepo and Lin, you're going to talk to us about how you've brought in the indigenous and local knowledge process in malawi and particularly how it was incorporated before you brought everyone together for a face-to-face -face trialogue thank you Thank you very much, Pippa. It's really great to join this session and share the experience that Malawi had with IROK in the process of the National Ecosystem Assessment. To start with, let me start by saying, um, following uh, decision 14, stroke one, so 12 of the Conference of Parties to the Convention on Biological Biodiversity, which encouraged um, parties to undertake national ecosystem assessment. So Malawi joined the national ecosystem assessment with the list of the with other countries, uh, considering the importance of the assessment uh, in, regarding the decisions policy decisions regarding conservation, as well as um, the importance of the assessment uh, when it comes to uh, developing the targets of the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. The assessment provides the basic baseline information that is required to provide realistic targets. So we started there that uh, assessment in 2020. 
So we launched the assessment. Uh, we had several stakeholders on board during the launch. And during that launch, um, stakeholders prioritized the, ecos the ecosystem types which we are su supposed to assess. So three ecosystem uh, types were selected, uh, the terrestrial, wetland, and, uh, and aquatic. During that uh, launch, um, IRK holders were not part of that, but then we realized the importance of IRK holders in the assessment. These are the local communities who are usually the implementers of the findings or initiative of biodiversity. So um, with that, during okay, during the, the launch, we also uh, drafted some uh, policy questions, brought up policy questions on which the assessment was supposed to be based. And uh, when we realized our local communities were not on board during that initial launch of the assessment project, we organized um, framing workshop. So we organized a regional framing workshop. Our country is divided into three regions, the Northern, Central and South. So we, we actually selected about eight districts, three in, in the Northern region, two in the Central and three in the South. So in each uh, uh, district, we had uh, five representatives from the local communities participating in the trial work. And uh, during the, uh, not the trial, the, the framing workshop, uh, where the communities were introduced to the national ecosystem assessment process that we're undertaking. And also they were given the opportunity to provide their views and, and to the, in the, um, the policy, policy questions. So their input were collected during the framing workshop. And thereafter we noted that um, um, not all the knowledge holders were present during the framing workshop. And also just to mention that before we engaged them, we, they, we requested them to sign the prior informed consent that their knowledge that they're going to share are going to be used in the national ecosystem assessment. And they agreed to that and they were able to share freely the knowledge they have about biodiversity and ecosystems in their own areas. Uh, later on, thank as we you. Realize... so thank you so much. So we'll we'll <laughs> come back to find about later on how you brought that in. But thank you so much for that honesty as well about how we realised that they weren't being involved. And even when we did the framing workshop, not everybody was there. So we'll pick up on that, um, Lillian. Thanks so much, Felipe. If you can talk to us a little bit about the application of this trialogue framework approach and how it overcame perhaps the silo approach that there is, you know, in amongst many different institutions and actors. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pippa and, and everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to get to, to tell you all of the insights we learned uh, from implementing these trialogues. These were subnational trialogues, and that's important to understand. We had uh, three different sessions, one in the Nariño region, uh, which is in the south of Colombia, very diverse mountainous rural uh, landscape, but also with the Pacific coast, uh, with the Afro-Colombian people, and also the connection to the Amazon region with a, a lot of indigenous communities that live there. And the other two sessions were focused on the Amazon region, uh, which is a very vast and remote territory, very diverse with a, a lot of uh, indigenous communities and a very complex history regarding uh, social, political, and environmental conflicts. And it's important also to understand why did we do this uh, trialogues then? Uh, we had the national ecosystem evaluation for a couple of years with powerful insights, but uh, very still very general calls to action that are difficult to implement at this national level. And we were in a political juncture. We were uh, just uh, before the elections for the uh, municipal administrations. So it was a perfect time to get together with the communities, uh, with different actors from academy, uh, so social, civil um, organizations, and the institutions to understand and reach a consensus of the priorities in the territory for the upcoming years. Um, and here, um, some of my reflections is that in both regions, we had a kind of a tense start to the dialogue. Uh, the actors uh, were using this space to voice out their complaints, to voice out their, their pain points uh, of what they thought was not working in the uh, administration of these territories. And, and it was important for us as the facilitation team to, to give them the space to speak up, but also 
to um, clarify the overarching goal that was to not to document these complaints, but to have a, a, a very open discussion on what are our common goals, what is the consensus of our priorities, and how can we make a, a joint actionable plan. And uh, here we were able in, in every case to turn the discussion around and, and to make the participants feel they are in a safe space. Also, it was important to them to realize that they are not alone, that uh, every one of them was feeling that they were the only uh, actors, institutions that were wanting uh, something to change, but everyone in the territory was having the same feeling and that was uh, very important for them to, to overcome this uh, uh, period of, of complaining and start building uh, this consensus of priorities. And also uh, for us, it was very important that the discussion was not only uh, framed with working across the sectors, across these silos, as, as you said, but also across scales uh, and the regional uh, perspective was very important. For them, it, there, there was a, a, a complaint that was very common, that was the uh, top-down approach of policy making and decision making. And here we, we had this uh, discourse that we were here to amplify their voice and to support a bottom-up uh, approach to decision making. And for them, it was uh, really valuable and it allowed for discussions to, to, to flourish between the actors. Wonderful, thank you. So we've got sort of bringing them forward because they weren't there and once they are there, it's about amplifying those voices across those different, within the territory and the different levels and scales as well. So we'll come back to you um, on that, Felipe. Thank you very much. So if we go back a little bit more into a deeper dive, Swede Bio, on that theoretical approach, and there is a question that's come up on the chat, which is the relationship between what you've just described and the IPBES framework approach. And, and that's actually what we would like you, Panilla, to um, give us a little bit more of an explanation about. So how does it, you know, we know it's been tested, the multiple evidence-based approach with success, but how does that enhance particularly work with Indigenous peoples and local communities? And I think what we'll do is we'll put up a slide um, through Alex, which will show in the right way um, what you do. Oh, you've got it in your background. That's fine. OK, thank, thank you very much, Camilla. Yeah, thank you. Well, the multiple evidence base is critical and inspiring for APES and other science policy frameworks, as it recognizes the richness in diversity of knowledge system and how there are values and perspectives of from indigenous and local knowledge that can contribute to how we understand na nature and how to best protect it and use it sustainable. And working with indigenous and local knowledge embraces diversity and social culture and uh, environmental knowledge, which is vital for inclusive assessment of nature and its linkage with people. Indigenous people's concepts that constitute uh, Sustainability, for example, differ markedly from the dominant sustainability discourses. It is therefore that IPES is promoting dialogues across different knowledge systems, and the multiple evidence-based approach is offering a systematic and consolidated way of doing this. The challenge for IPES has been to also ensure the indigenous and local knowledge is included in the assessment all the way through from the work on the ground and the documented sources up to the synthesis and summary for policymakers, which is the end product of all assessments. Here remains challenges as the work of compiling assessment is still within a framework of that which builds on scientific knowledge. It is not easy for IPES to, for example, find authors from among ILK holders, but the ILK dialogues that from the beginning was inspired from the Gunayala dialogue has contributed a lot of this inclusion as it then would be a documented reports and so on. Other advantages for IPES with the MEB approach is that it can still stimulate solutions well suited for implementation and therefore contributes to sustainable governments. This is important in IPES as its assessment are aimed at to be the base for policy making. There is evidence that from science, uh, from science, that if you take advantage of 
the knowledge and proposals of the holders of indigenous and local knowledge in the design of policies and engage with them in the process, the policies will be much faster and better implemented. So the multiple evidence base has served to elevate and highlight ILK holders' knowledge and strengthen their capacity and confidence to articulate, to articulate it and argue for it and introduce their own proposals. Uh, well, and when it's recognized and respected, it's also a way to re uh, reduce the structural power imbalances across science and other knowledge system. And that also is a way to have alternative pathways to sustainability. Thank you so much, Pamela. And let's take that back now across to the Malawi example. And Lillian, you talked about having understood there that those differences that Penamilla is talking about of how you bring in that knowledge and address some of those power dynamics once you'd got people in the framing workshops how did you then use this approach to bring them into during and after the trilogue um, uh, the trilogue itself as an event of dialogue and from a government perspective from a ministry perspective why was this different, this approach to the business as usual or a formal consultation? Thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Lillian. Do we have you? Oh, sorry, I think I was mute. <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you so much. Um, just to continue on where I stopped, after the framing workshop, we noted there are some key uh, knowledge holders who are not present because of age, they couldn't travel to where the meetings were conducted. So we conducted field visits to actually list them and get the knowledge about biodiversity and how they are conserving biodiversity in their own communities. Um, and after that, this all this own initiative um, dealing with local and indigenous knowledge holders were supported by UNESCO. I should acknowledge that. And during the trial, uh, all representatives from all the uh, districts which were represented in the framing workshop were invited. And also we had a community next to the venue where the trial was conducted. They also came and be represented. During the trial, we uh, have three knowledge system holders. We had the, the local communities themselves, the policy makers and the expert coming together to validate the policy questions. That these are specific policy questions which um, from the specific uh, thematic areas that we are working on. That's the wetland, um, aquatic and terrestrial. So they came together, they deliberated on the policy questions. So they, up to the point, they reached the consensus. So all the views from the local communities were taken on board as well as the sun, the sun aspect. The multiple value of uh, uh, biodiversity in the, in the communities was also incorporated, which actually complemented uh, the science, scientific knowledge that is available on biodiversity and ecosystem services in the country. Uh, that was during the dialogue, and uh, as I said, there was a community nearby, so we visited the community and appreciated how they are managing their forestry, the nearby forestry. They have managed to restore a degraded forest area, and also they shared uh, some, some practices which they do in order to continue managing their, their forest. After the dialogue, um, we also went back to the field to share um, the final scoping report that was approved so that they can appreciate um, that whatever they had uh, uh, inputted into the scoping report was taken on board. This encouraged them to actually feel that they are recognized, their knowledge is recognized, and uh, they really are part of the process. And we feel that even beyond, uh, after the evaluation stage, once we develop the report, they'll be able to actually um, like on the, the process and report. Coming to the, um, the policy perspective and how the trial enhanced the process of, of knowledge co-creation on nature, uh, uh, let me start by saying 
during the business as, as usual, normally the scientists, the policy makers, even the communities, they work in isolation. And uh, there are times when the scientists would develop an assessment report, which they may or may not consult uh, local communities, may not incorporate the indigenous and local knowledge, but by the end of it, they would want the findings to be implemented by the local communities, and it becomes very difficult to own that process. But with the trial of coming in, we are seeing the difference that the local communities are able to provide uh, knowledge uh, that uh, together with the scientists, the scientists. So there is that co-creation of knowledge during the production of the uh, national ecosystem assessment, which is very, very important, considering that uh, um, the findings, when we look at restoration, it's the local communities that are going to restore. And also in terms of the knowledge, the local communities are better pressed to, to share the knowledge of what has been happening over the over time in their ecosystems because they have been there and they have interla been interacting with the environment and biodiversity, and they are better in better place to share what they have in their in their communities as well as the trends in biodiversity in their communities. So this um, is very important and it has actually enhanced uh, it will enhance evidence based decision making. Um, which will not only consider science, but will also consider practical indigenous and local knowledge, which is very important for the sustainability and also for effective implementation of biodiversity conservation measures. Thank you. Thank you, people. Thank you so much. Um, there, Lillian. And we'll move straight across to Colombia. And there's some fantastic questions coming into the chat now. And, and Felipe, you know, can you give us a little bit now um, some more in-depth examples of, you know, how power and dynamics were navigated during the trialogue um, in your Trialogos de la Vida? Um, that, that would be really good. And I think people's questions in the chat are really indicating towards this. So it'd be lovely to hear from you about that now. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Biba. Of course. Um, well, regarding power dynamics, I, I believe there are many, many insights uh, from different perspectives. Uh, for instance, gender dynamics, uh, working with indigenous and local communities from this uh, uh, top-down and bottom-up approaches I, I mentioned before. This uh, It's something that's very Colombian, but uh, I imagine the rest of our world experiences also is the this centralism versus regional governance and authority, because uh, Colombia have a, a long history of, of the capital city uh, holding most of the political power in, in, in decision making, and therefore the regions uh, often feel that they're being left out. So during the trialogues, this came up uh, a lot and, and was a, an important part of the conversation. And also uh, another uh, side of this was uh, how to interact with all of the actors from from the territory being uh, seen as outsiders they are the locals we are we are the outsiders and how can we bridge that gap between between us so uh, first I, I believe an underlying factor for the success of the trialogues is is building trust uh, we rapidly understood that there was uh, little confidence and little trust between uh, the different organizations actors and leaders that were present with the institutional framework or, or the political structures of, of the country. And so uh, when we get there and we say, let's build some actionable plans, some proposals uh, to go forward and, and, and address biodiversity and climate change issues, uh, they, they were not that um, comfortable with that. They said, that communities uh, do not trust uh, that something is gonna happen. Uh, you have to understand that Colombia goes beyond the capital, beyond Bogota, and that the indigenous communities have their, their right to self-government and self-determination, and that needs to be respected. And uh, they, they also highlighted that no one knows the territory better than them. So for us, it was uh, very important to be humble in this dialogue and to reiterate that we were not there uh, as an outsider to tell them what to do or how to do it but uh, better to, to build up a platform for their voices to be heard 
to to take these ideas and these feelings and these proposals to other uh, scenarios where they might be heard and they uh, should be uh, taken into account in decision making. So um, the political juncture of the elections and the the uh, new new municipal administrations starting was a perfect excuse for for overcoming this uh, difficulty. Uh, another thing that uh, I want to 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 highlight is that uh, the regions are not homogeneous within themselves, and this tension that was uh, being mentioned between Bogota and the rest of the country was also being felt by them within the subnational region. So within Nariño or within the Amazon, they also said that they were feeling this disconnection between their own uh, decision makers. So uh, we were uh, trying to, to, to help them uh, communicate with their own candidates and their own uh, new uh, administrations to, to empower the, the, the dialogue and, and also like get these proposals within the, the next um, development plans for the for, uh, upcoming years. Uh, another example, a very different example uh, from power dynamics is uh, the inclusiveness and, and participation with uh, diverse communities. So uh, uh, a powerful uh, thing that happened to us was in the Amazon trialogue uh, that we held in Putumayo, we had the case of, of, I believe she was called Liliana. She was a, a leader from a very remote community of indigenous people, but she had very, uh, very little um, knowledge of Spanish. So there was a language barrier that was very hard for us to navigate. Uh, hopefully, uh, or, or thankfully, uh, one of the other participants uh, knew her her mother tongue and was able to to translate. It was not a perfect translation. There was a, a strong language barrier, but it made us recognize that if we can, cannot even talk in the same language, how are we supposed to uh, support this trialogue uh, methodology? So uh, there, the the territory gave us the answer. We need to 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 speak to them before and, and be ready for these issues to come up and uh, to to navigate this, this difficulty. Thankfully, as, a, as I said, we were able to, to get Liliana into the methodology and, and to take the, the insights that she that she had and, and made her voice uh, felt heard. Um, and this uh, actually gets me to the, the next reflection is that uh, not only the facilitation is important during the trial, but all of the work before is is crucial. If we do not have uh, a, a very well uh, built uh, invitation and, and and an identification of, of leaders, communities, actors, we will not have uh, the opportunity to have uh, meaningful discussions. So, for instance, um, both in Nariño and Amazon, it happened that leaders of women uh, groups were present, and they uh, they were very um, powerful in the way that they they insisted in the gender approach being uh, part of the proposals. Many of the other participants were not aware of the importance of these issues. And uh, this discussion was was very uh, interesting because uh, despite the, the, the hard time they were having to grasp why gender dynamics were important, uh, in the end it worked out and uh, participants from uh, academia and civil society uh, were, were uh, in consensus of this being one of the priorities in the region. Uh, another thing that uh, was important uh, for this uh, inclusiveness and representation is to understand uh, how remote these regions were and the effort that uh, UNDP and Humboldt and the Colombian government made to actually have these persons present because some of them had to travel for uh, several days to, to get here in different uh, transport uh, medium. And uh, despite that, the, the actors that we had in the dialogue said that representativeness was still limited. And for us, it was uh, kind of heart-wrenching to, to understand that despite this, these efforts, it's still very, very hard to, to have a, a, a exhaustive participation. And um, this uh, preparatory work was uh, important to have all of the actors present to 
actually have these power dynamic discussions being uh, as thoughtful as possible. Thank you so much, Felipe. And I, I think just the openness, the frankness, the application genuinely of this methodology and the self-critical way in which you're all telling us about what happened well and what the questionings were about dealing with representation, for example, is, is key to a really rich dialogue now with all of you as the participants in our Q&A. Before we go into that, thank you, Felipe. I will have all the, pa the panelists up on the screen. But just before that, Alex, if you could help us just look at the word cloud and see the kinds of words that are already coming up from all of you about the ways in which we work with indigenous knowledge and local wisdom. And it's interesting because these also reflect, I think, what the panelists have been saying and some of the questions that we're getting in the Q&A, which will be very interesting to discuss. It's about that inclusivity, the respect, meaningful participation, the fact it's a necessity, a no brainer, but also it's how to look at avoiding conflict and that co-production, co-creation um, in a participatory dialogue, openness to curiosity. So I think this is fascinating. Um, I've had that open mind, which is very, very much open mind, open heart, open will to do things differently, which is absolutely central to theory U. So thank you very much, Alex. If we put that slide away and if we can bring up all of the panelists and what we'll do now is to bring those questions that are in the chat in a way in which all of us can discuss them. And I think what we heard there was how important it is when, when people are wary of being approached um, about this. And it's about the importance of truly being heard and being listened to. So Hari Natarajan, I hope I've got your name correct there. You've asked, and I'd like to ask you, Lillian, which is about well, how, do you, how can you get this willingness of government to be there, but not just to be there, to be present and truly listen. And if you are truly listening and hearing this local wisdom, then what are ways to institutionalize that? Because it, these are usually marginalized voices. Lillian, can you give us a little bit of your um, uh, yeah, sort of insight from being a government um, representative yourself in Malawi? Uh, thank you very much for that question. It's a very important question. Uh, from the word go, the assessment was initiated by government itself. So it's a government owned, though we have a university in our country implementing on our behalf, but it's a government process that we want to employ as we are planning biodiversity initiative. As part of the Convention on Biological Diversity, we are supposed to uh, submit a periodic or national reports. And the assessment is very instrumental in guiding uh, the, the report. Therefore, government is willing already by becoming part to the convention, becoming member state to the EB based process, because everything that we are doing in the national ecosystem assessment, we have adopted the uh, methodology by which is uh, under EB based. So that, it was not really difficult to, to bring together the policy makers because they know as a party to the convention, we need to report. We are also developing the uh, National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. And uh, for us to come up with, with realistic targets, we really need to have uh, this assessment um, taking place in the country. So the willingness of government was there from the way to go, from the the time we expressed interest to participate in the assessment, that was the time we started to have that interest. And also now uh, local and indigenous knowledge is something that internationally people, uh, uh, it is of, um, we are focusing much of a whole government approach. We're not leaving nobody behind. So including the local communities, including the local knowledge must be utilized for us to successfully uh, and effectively uh, conserve biodiversity as we are approaching to the, if we want to meet the vision of biodiversity by 2050.
Thank you. So Lillian, I'm going to be a little bit sort of devil's advocate. So it, did, did everybody from government immediately say, of course, because we've got all this um, need to, to do this work and present it and there's international pressure, all of government were very interested in being there and listening, truly listening to that. Was it that easy or were there sectors of government where it was difficult uh, or unusual? <laughs> no, we didn't have any challenge because uh, most of the stakeholders who were engaged in this process are those to deal with natural resource management. So sectors like wildlife, forestry, tourism, those are, they know the importance of biodiversity and they have felt the impact of biodiversity loss over the years. Yeah, so in general, I can say the whole of government. And also when we look at the uh, the government development plan, uh, environmental sustainability is one of the enabling um, enable, enabler that will ensure that we achieve the vision for the country. So Thank you, like, Thank you very community. much. Yeah. Good, and we'll we'll ask others to kind of reflect a little bit if that's the same in terms of governments within their experience as well. Felipe, um, we're continuing this about trust building. So one trust building is if the government um, is running, for example, part of the trialogues, um, are they truly there and truly listening? The other part of the trust building um, that has come up with questions from Maria Gonzalez is about um, the application of free prior and informed consent and whether or not the way in which you were conducting the trialogue and the assessment did fall within that context of applying FPIC, and also whether your approach was just about gathering knowledge for research to be part of an assessment, or as you were seem to be alluding to, it was also about tackling and addressing some of those resource issues and conflicts that obviously then um, were part of the icebergs in a trilogue where, where, as you say, you talk to people beforehand, you map out where some of those structural power dynamics are, and you're addressing them as well, or are you just gathering research? Thanks, Felipe. Uh, thanks, Pippa, and uh, the questions. So, uh, as, I, as I was mentioning before, uh, it's important to understand the moment at which we did this, this dialogue. We already had the results from the NEA, from the National Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, and we were uh, just before some political elections. So for us, it, this was not uh, an exercise in research, but more an exercise in how to promote uh, environmental governance and strengthen environmental governance in the territory. So one of the first questions uh, uh, that came from Besnet was, if we have this uh, assessment, uh, it's ready, it's printed, uh, we have a, a, a summary for policy makers. So what do we do with this? And they, they, they had just printed some infographics that uh, were a, a very useful summary of these evaluations. But nevertheless, in the subnational level, it's very, very hard to understand what to do with it. And also, uh, the government had this other question about uh, some other instruments for climate change uh, adaptation and, and mitigation that were uh, regional instruments, uh, like uh, plans for, for the administrations to, to address this issue, that were very good in paper, but in practice, they were not working. So the trial was uh, like uh, 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 space to understand with the actors of the territory how to have this knowledge, which is evidence-based approach, and these instruments, and actually uh, put them to practice in, in, in a, a very real context, which is the writing of the new development plans for these territories for the next four years. What do these plans need to, uh, to say? What actions need to be funded? What uh, are the goals that need to be uh, set out? So uh, this uh, allowed for the, the trust building exercise to, to work because uh, it doesn't matter if you're coming from uh, academia in Nariño or if you're an international organization or, or if you're part of the environmental authorities. You, you all have this uh, need to, to address climate change and address biodiversity loss and address uh, benefit sharing in the territory. And 
we're giving you a space to put this into a document that will be presented to the candidates. And we, we had, after the trial, the opportunity to uh, be in a forum with the seven candidates for the governorship of Mariño and tell them, this is the voice of the, of the people. This is the voice of your institutions. Uh, will you sign a pact that says that these priorities will be included in your administration's plan? And uh, seven of them signed, including the one that uh, finally uh, won the election. So we hope, we really hope that this uh, has an impact on the way uh, the plan uh, is being uh, put out in the following months. So um... thank you, Felipe. So what we're seeing as well from the Malawi example and from the Colombia example is one where this is used for co-creation, for that knowledge gathering and synthesis to address the um, assessment findings that is a, a key aim for the government. But then following the assessment, how that is then used as a tool to address some of those issues in the territory, as you've just been saying, Felipe, and have policy influence. So that wariness of people being involved is seeing that their voice can be heard, can have um, influence because you're using those tools for policy influence too. So that's really interesting. If, if we take a bit of a step backwards and higher up as well, now that we're talking about having that kind of democratic influence, where often there is a deficit in democratic um, decision making. And I think Jose Vicente Troya um, is put his question in. So Panilla or Puri, it's this question about how you see the MEB approach and trialogue approach providing opportunities for addressing um, the democratic process and human security as well. I don't know if you've got anything to illuminate us on there. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for the question, because this is, of course, something that is very obvious in many processes that we, we have to also recognize that we are in very different situations in different countries. And generally, as we said, with the multiple evidence-based approach model, by strengthening knowledge and the recognition of the value of the knowledge is like a long-term process for recognizing knowledge and, and also making people visible because they have something to say and contribute. But another aspect is how we can also apply a human rights-based approach in the dialogues. And actually much of the way the dialogue process works is very similar to the human rights-based approach that you start with the importance of information, thereafter the importance of taking part in decision-making, and then the uh, importance of also being able to uh, reclaim or, or bringing up your concern if the right decision are not taken. Then of course, as we also saw, for example, in, in uh, the Malawi case, they also concluded that if we bring in people in policy processes, when they are ready for implementation, they will be much better implemented. <laughs> so it's also for, policymakers a way of coming uh, to, to facilitate their own work and, and maybe this is there we are back again on, on this long-term vision of contributing to better governance of biodiversity because the local and indigenous knowledge is so critical for how you can govern biodiversity locally and and, and maybe by taking it that way, we can also encourage governments that have some hesitation to realize that, well, this, this actually facilitates their work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanilla. And so um, coming to that, which is that possibility to be able to um, inform and know what's happening with the suggestions, the comments, the contributions that are made, that accountability piece, you know, around the governance principles. So, Felipe, within the Colombian example, there is a question from Sofia Ravelli um, asking whether or not through the methodology itself, so one, 
acknowledging and, and, and congratulating you for seeing that, you know, you're acknowledging power dynamics, not sweeping them under the rug, dealing with them before the dialogue and during it. Was there any particular part of the methodology that helped to create safe spaces for um, people within it? And like, for example, protocols for the dialogue when they took place? Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, there, there were several um, key points for ensuring this. Uh, first, uh, uh, an example. When we were planning uh, the trial, there was this uh, point in the agenda where we were going to do a deep dive on the biodiversity characterization of the region. And at first, uh, we as the National uh, Biodiversity Institute were going to, to give that information out. And we, we said, this might not be the best. Uh, we want some of the local actors to tell us about their biodiversity. They know the territory. So uh, we got in touch with the University of Nariño and one of their researchers is, is quite an expert in the field. And he was the one to, to tell us about the biodiversity. And it was a, a space for him to, to let us know that uh, sometimes when national uh, information is put out, some of the biodiversity of Nariño is not well characterized. And he gave examples and he showed us uh, some things and, and told stories about the, the, the territory that were very dear to them. And it was important for them to, to, to feel uh, this was an exercise for them being uh, built by them uh, and not someone else coming here uh, characterizing their uh, territory. Another thing that was important in the methodology for this is the, the facilitation process was very personal. So at the beginning of the session, there were some um, exercises that helped everyone get in touch with their life story and why were they there and what could they get out of this and why was this meaningful for them? Uh, and from then on, it, it was a, a personal exercise for everybody. So um, that made everyone open up uh, uh, very easily. And finally, I would like to, to highlight another thing that the methodology allows is that uh, we were working in separate uh, groups or, or tables and they were tailor-made. We were trying to ensure that uh, institutions were working with communities and were working with academia in every table. So the discussions might be hard, but they were being uh, had. Uh, we didn't want one table pursuing one goal uh, for the communities and one table for the institutions. We wanted every table to have every point of view. So in this sense, uh, the trust was being uh, built in every table and then we were reaching a consensus of the whole group. Uh, it was very, very easy to, to achieve that. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Felipe. And um, Penilla and Pura, if we go back to the sort of both theoretically, but also applying this. So um, Harry has got a follow up question, which is well, great to hear that we're looking at bringing both indigenous um, and local wisdoms to the table alongside what is known often as expertise, biodiversity expertise, the natural science expertise. And, you know, how can you make sure he's saying that they're aligned uh, or not several contradictions? And I remember very much in our Cameroon trialogue where the natural scientists at one point said, well, you know, it's um, that kind of knowledge and wisdom is qualitative, it's good for maybe a text box, an anecdote to um, illustrate, but there is not the rigor. There is not the rigor, so you cannot integrate these because there is not the rigor that you apply to natural science, which is proving and disproving knowledge. And, and it was very interesting there to see, I think what Harry's bringing up, that, that, that often when it really gets to it, sort of a clash between disciplines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. But actually, I mean, uh, what we also stress very much in a multiple evidence-based approach, to go back to those indigenous peoples in the Gudanjala dialogue who was so frustrated that scientists always wanted to make, make their own evidence for even believing them, that all knowledge systems have 
their own institutions and actors and processes for validate the evidence. They are, I mean, an institution, we have the peer review of a university. The um, indigenous knowledge system will have their elders who have ways of coming together and analyze new experiences, making new observations. And their conclusion can many times, I mean, be like going the same direction as the science. And then you have these two dots and, and we can synthesize. But it can also be very much contributing to an enriched picture if you have something going very like far away from the scientific dot, if you say so. That's quite interesting. It's it's not the problem because there is where you start the co-creation of knowledge and formulate the joint problem formulation and start to work together. And there are so many examples where you suddenly realize things that, okay, they didn't see the wind did work the same way as our weather station because they were going to much smaller spaces and where you have, I mean, what you find is that the microclimate makes so much differences, for example. And, and then without the, their knowledge and, op uh, and observation from, from the indigenous knowledge system, you, you would never really realize and found solutions for getting better weather observations, for example. Uh, was it like what that's you a were... very 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 good excellent this is, this is just what you did which is bring it back up to both the framework and the theory but also in reality yeah. what it means to be able to truly co-create and find those openings for yeah. new and fresh findings and especially when we're talking about biodiversity in places where it's still so much to understand and discover and particularly with climate change where this is constantly changing and adapting as well so that 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 need to learn together becomes ever more urgent so yeah, yeah. absolutely fantastic and also just to add that we prefer to not call about in uh, talk about integration what we as that is like testing one with another but that we say bridging, inclusion, connecting, connecting dots. And, and so we still have integrity in each knowledge system when you have this dialogue across knowledge system. And, and you can agree in a synthesis, but then it's still like from two strands of valid knowledge or 10 mm -hmm. strands, which is quite different from having one testing the other. Thank you very much. And Sophia is coming back. She wants to dig down a little bit deeper. So she's saying, so she hears this, but then if overall, um, and perhaps Lillian and Felipe, you can give us your final reflections on this. If in fact, the national ecosystem assessment itself is based on a um, scientific framework for scientific knowledge, how can you truly ensure that these other types of wisdom um, are, can be truly evaluated and synthesized, mobilized, synthesized and negotiated as being um, proposed by the MEB process. If the framework itself is something which is coming from a different um, worldview and discipline. So, um, and I think that's where somehow the IPBES and its adoption of the multiple evidence-based approach within its conceptual framework for the ecosystem assessment findings um, aims to ensure that that doesn't happen, that there's not a dominance primarily of that natural science approach. But Lillian, would you like to give your reflections on that as to whether or not it's still very dominant or really there really is a truly sort of empowering and co-learning within that space? And I just think you need to unmute Lillian. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yes, I would agree to say that because um, the process started from the scientific um, sort of field, 
And then we, with the EP base, we have just now started to mainstream local and indigenous knowledge. So still you could feel that the science dominates more in the assessment, even as in our case, now we have started the evaluation stage. But what we are saying is that we are mainstreaming IROK in all the chapters. So if it was something that maybe from the initial goal when we are starting the assessment, IROK was considered, maybe you could say they could balance up. But suffice to say that uh, during the trial, uh, the science, uh, the expert were open-minded, the people were just open-minded to listen to the uh, IROK knowledge holders. And still there are elements, of course, there are some elements of doubt in some cases, but you still find that there are some knowledge and practices which the indigenous knowledge are undertaking to conserve biodiversity, which are validated with the knowledge that we have scientifically. And also something interesting, which we also saw that when you look at the multiple value of biodiversity, there was rich knowledge about uh, the use of different species in the in their local communities as compared to that which the scientists know. So Lily, now we are coming to balancing up and the scientists are trying to now accept that indeed the local communities have the knowledge, even me, which are still relevant. And sometimes the scientists are using that local knowledge to develop further. For example, if you talk of medicinal plants, they use the indigenous knowledge and you no know, develop further to find out the medicine to, to manufacture medicinal, you know, medicines and pharmace pharmaceutical products. So yeah, that's that's what I can say. Uh, uh, as for the thank question. you, Lillian, and, and what a great way to enter. One is like how you're saying how just the whole process of adopting the multiple evidence based approach and applying the trialogues approach um, through that is that you have had a, a real shift. And I think it's a power dynamic shift as well within the assessment to say rather than indigenous and local knowledge being viewed as a chapter, it is now how that informs all of the chapters about the values, the trends, um, the challenges, and also what kind of policies are needed to address biodiversity loss within, within your country. Um, you ended on quite a tantalizing one, which I think comes back to one of the questions which was in the chat, which is, so then how do you safeguard knowledge and intellectual property rights if obviously then that does open up to new markets in terms of medicinal properties? And obviously the safeguarding around that and wariness is what I think we could have a whole other webinar on. But I'm going to say <laughs> thank you so much to our panelists, which is... Panilla and Puri from Sweet Bio, Dr. Lilia Chimpepo from the La Malawian government and Felipe Rivera from the Humboldt Institute. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand over now to Yuko so you can understand how the materials from this um, webinar will be shared. Thank you, Yuko. Thank you very, very much, all the panel members. Um, Pippa, also for great, great facilitation of the session and also all the participants for um, sharing very rich insight and then but provoking questions and an input. And then like by just looking at all these things, it, it reminds us that engaging multi-stakeholders, working with local communities or harnessing indigenous and local knowledge, you know, those are not a new idea. And it, it's kind of norm that they have to be incorporated into the UNDP's work or development partners work. However, Translating these ideas into action is not necessarily yet straightforward, and then we are not mastering it yet. And then this is why this kind of um, the opportunity is very important for us to share the knowledge or share the experiences. And then we are not having this to show the bestness success. We would like to experience, like share the experience with all the participants, and then get the uh, the more insights and then feedback, which will allow us to also like the fertilize, uh, cross fertilize our like different works and then improve our approaches to our the um, the well, the beneficiaries or partners um, at different levels. So thank you so, so much for um, the, the great session uh, for, um, yes. And then the, uh, I would like to just request um, Alex to share the screen. Uh, before moving like directly into the closing remark, um, 
the there's one slide which shows the links uh which could um which will help people to better understand what we are doing as bestnet and in different component as well as the trialog uh, work uh, and then this slide is going to be shared together with other resources to all the participants after this webinar so please take a look and then please feel free to approach us for further uh, dialogue um, and then questions or the sharing the insights we are really looking forward to um the continuing this discussion to yes help each other's work um, engaging communities policy makers scientists into um, our work and then like the the maximize our impact uh, with that note, I would like to now hand over to Terence Hey Edi, uh, Program Manager uh, of the Local Action, Nature and Indigenous Peoples, who actually leads the Nature Hub's work around IOK. And then thank you, Terence, for staying quiet all these times. You are the lead of our team uh, in the Hub, uh, working with the IOK. So I would like to request um, you to share the wider UNDP perspective and your insights, which you give us the closing and then the take away message on how we could move forward from here. Thank you so much. And over to you, Terence. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Yuko. I'm struggling a bit with my internet connection, so I might switch off the camera. But um, having been at the Kunayala workshop in 2012 with Penilla um, in, in Panama before the IPBES one, it's really encouraging to learn and hear about so many of these um, trilogues and the way in which these, these exchanges are being institutionalized in a much more organized uh, way. But um, in the chat, I put in a few references to some of the earlier um, frameworks. If we go back to the, the in 19, 1988, the International Society of Ethnobiology, um, before the Rio summit came up with a lot of these uh, similar thinking, but that was more in the academic world in terms of the way in which co-creation of knowledge happens between um, Western trained scientists and indigenous peoples. And from that, um, the in the late 90s, after the global biodiversity um, uh, assessment uh, from, from 1995, there was the volume on cultural and spiritual values of biodiversity. And I'll just put it in, in the chat there for people's um, uh, recall. And then in the early 2000s, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment realized too late that, that no indigenous peoples had been involved. And so um, as UNDP, we had organized in 2004 in the Permanent Forum some um, uh, uh, attempts to bring in more of the perspectives of indigenous people for the, the, the Millennium Assessment. So. Um, I think what 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 we're seeing now, um, post uh, the you know the 2012 process with IPBES and some of the things happening in the IPCC as well at that time, um, in the the fifth assessment report um, for IPCC, there was a uh, also a big push to try and bring in uh, traditional knowledge, um, and this was with UNESCO and the UN University from outside of the um, grey literature into a more formalized uh, form of. Of, of recognition. And then 2015 with the Paris Accord, um, the, the reference to uh, traditional knowledge for both adaptation and uh, mitigation. And from that, we've seen the local communities and indigenous peoples platform in, in the UNF uh, C. So um, I think what I would just like to highlight in, in, in closing is, is the, um, in the, the way in which there's more attention given to this um, uh, blending, weaving, braiding of knowledge. Um, but it's creating new inst institutional structures across uh, different Rio conventions. So we're seeing it in the CBD um, with the IPBES, in the in the climate with the IPCC, and also uh, a little bit in the in the in the in the UNCCD around the restoration agenda. And this actually creates a sort of a burden on Indigenous peoples having to deal with multiple structures of the UN, whereas for them it's much more um, holistic. So I think. As UNDP, as a sort of closing remark, we could reflect on how, as UNDP, we support the climate promise um, for the NDCs. We support the uh, NBSAPs, and we work with uh, BestNet and with UNESCO and, and, and many of the governments. How can we um, bring some of these things together so that we no longer have three uh, Rio conventions, which are siloed in relation to a traditional knowledge? And I think uh, the, the trilogue approach that BestNet has uh, uh, pioneered so well is, is a really encouraging way um, that we might uh, consider uh, doing that. So thank you so much and back over to you, uh, Yuko and Pipa. Thank you very much, Lance. And then thank you for the reminder that this like a trilogue 
or like the dialogue approach uh, itself uh, cannot is not the one uh, to be um, practiced only in one like thematic area, just like biodiversity as we do. And then there are so many different like thematic issues, climate, land, uh, biodiversity, or like you know the outside of the nature the arena, there are so many interlinked issues that we have to address. And then that also, also expands the, um, the stakeholder groups. So the this is also the learning curve for us, um, how to like expand this the dialogue approach beyond the, um, the group that we are focusing on and then connecting to the different issues for the holistic implementation of the sustainable development goals. So thank you so, so much for this like a powerful and then the encouraging messages. And then I would like to now uh, pass on to Sophia for the uh, explanation of the way forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. I just want to say how appreciative I am for the richness and nuance of this discussion. I think there's something to be said for the kinds of questions we're asking. Um, but just to mention, this is the end of this particular learning series that was on the theme of dialogues to catalyze systems transformation. However, as the integration and in human development communities of practice and others, um, we still are invested in building more pathways and learning opportunities for this work about more awareness-based systems change. Um, so one of the ones that will be coming up and, and we'll keep this posted is about um, under UNDP's integration community practice, as well as human development, we'll be launching an awareness based systems transformation hub and essentially want to create more opportunities for these types of conversations to the wider UN community and partners. Um, and we also want to keep documenting learnings too about these kinds of dialogues and case studies. And we'll also be creating an online version of our field guide and, and posting some of this there. So yeah, it's a bit general at this moment, but just to say there will be more coming at you. And of course, keep looking into the work of the BESNET team and we'll be sharing the slides and all the links and information and contact after this. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for attending. See you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.